All right, so today we're going to continue in our study of Shabbat. This is part two. And again, I want to remind us that what we're going to do is approach this very critically important teaching with open minds, hearts, spirits, so that we can truly receive what Yahweh desires from us in guarding, keeping, and remembering the Shabbat. Now, what I want to do today first is give a review of what we covered last week. Now, it may sound like I'm just going to reteach everything from last week, and I probably am. This, this subject is very important, and I want to make sure that I've been very clear on what I've said, because there are people already looking for clarification on some things I said. So we're going to go through a quick review from last week. Hopefully, it won't take very long, and then we'll get into some things. Plus, I'm going to insert and add a few things that I didn't cover fully last week. So... So we began in Exodus 31, verses 12 through 18, and we learned that Shabbat is a sign between Yahweh and his people. We learned that we are to guard Yahweh's Shabbatot, his Sabbaths. We learned that it was a sign between Yahweh and the children of Israel forever throughout their generation. So it wasn't just a sign between him and his people way back then, but it's a sign forever throughout the generations between him and his people, the children of Israel that this everlasting covenant was to be observed throughout our generations. So it was to be, to be observed, kept, guarded over. It is also, the Sabbath was to let us know that it is Yahweh that is making us kadosh, holy or set apart. This has to do with setting us apart, making us kadosh or holy. And so we, were also to, we learned that we are to guard the Shabbatot, simply the plural for Sabbaths or Shabbat, The Shabbatot, for they are to be kadosh, holy and set apart to us. So as we were to be set apart by the day, we were to make sure that we set it apart, treated it in a set apart way. So what does it mean to be set apart, though? We've talked about it. It means to be separated out for the sole purpose of serving the Almighty. That's the idea of kadosh or set apart. Now, this came up last week, but we weren't clarifying it enough, and so people had asked me to clarify it. We were also learned that those that desecrate or profane the Shabbatot were to be put to death, or they had earned the death penalty. So let's understand what that's all about. The Hebrew for profane or desecrate is mechalalea, or actually mechalalecha, to desecrate or to renege or break an agreement. So this has the idea, because people say, what does it mean to profane it? Well, you're, you're not only desecrating it, meaning spoiling it and doing damage to it in some way, but it has the idea of breaking or reneging on an agreement. Since it's a sign between him and his people, it's by agreement. Covenant is an agreement. He says two cannot walk together unless they have an agreement. And so what he's saying is that when you profane the Shabbatot, you're breaking or reneging on the agreement. What was the agreement, by the way? Exodus 19 says in verse 5 and 6, the agreement was, if you would agree to do everything I say, I will agree to take you as my people. And so they agreed. And since we are generationally connected to that agreement and in line with that agreement, and we come into covenant as those coming into agreement with that agreement, if you can say it that way, if you don't keep Shabbat correctly the way he instructs, if you don't keep and guard and remember Shabbat, you are actually reneging on the agreement. You're breaking the covenant. So that's vitally important that we understand what it means. Now, the word desecrate means to treat with violent disrespect. To treat with violent disrespect. To profane means to treat in an irreverent, an irreverent or disrespectful way. So when you treat Shabbat in in an irreverent or disrespectful way, if you are doing violence to it, if you're doing it, you know, to treat it with violent disrespect, then this breaking is called profaning or desecrating. Now, it's interesting because when you look at it as doing violent disrespect, desecrating from that point of view, I didn't have this in my notes, so I'll have to add it, but in Ezekiel 22, I think of the verse right away, it says that they have done violence to my teachings. Ezekiel 22 and verse 25 says, there's a conspiracy of her prophets in her midst. 
Like a roaring lion tearing the prey, they have devoured life, they have taken wealth and precious matters, they have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have done violence. What does that mean? They've desecrated what? They says they've desecrated, they've done violence to my teaching, they profaned. He's saying it twice here. They've done violence and they've done violence to my set-apart matters. How have they done this? They've not distinguished between the set-apart and profane, nor have they made the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have hidden their eyes from my Shabbatot, from my Sabbaths. Hmm. You see the connection here? He says, and because of this, I am profaned, in other words, treated in an irreverent and disrespectful way. I am profaned. Interesting. Interesting. So that's from Ezekiel 22. So back to what we're learning in Exodus 31, we're also told, so hopefully we're understanding that this is going to be huge as we have the context for all of this, that are we, are, is what we're doing disrespectful? Is it irreverent? In other words, lacking awe and respect and honor for the one who put something in place? Are we treating it in any kind of violent way? Violent meaning that we're damaging it in such a way that it no longer looks like what it was meant to look like, that we're ripping it to some sort, we're ripping at it, we're, we're destroying it in some way, we're violent. Now, Christianity's done a really good job by simply saying it was all done away with, that's sort of violent, but that doesn't mean that we're exempt also from doing violence to things, Okay? So we're going to have that kind of mindset, hopefully, as we go forward, that this is what we're wanting to avoid. But he said, those that desecrate or profane the Shabbatot were to be put to death or earn the death penalty. Now it says, the nephesh, or living creature that does work, the word there is melacha, on the Shabbatot was to be cut off from among the people. So to be cut off, the Hebrew context here appears to be best translated as excommunication. In other words, being excluded from participation in the services and rituals of Israel. This is the idea of being cut off. Because somebody asked that last week also during the afterburn. Well, what does it mean to be cut off and what does it mean to profane? So we want to kind of cover those things today. So it has more of the idea of excommunication, being excluded from participation in the services and rituals of Israel, being treated relationally as being outside the covenant as a goy or as a Gentile. So the person to be cut off is now to be treated like they were not part of the covenant, that they had excluded themselves out, they had decided to choose to be elsewhere, to be now treated like a Gentile or a goy. This is the relationship. Now, by the way, that's not a status you want to have. The status of being outside. Because remember, there's only two groups of people on the planet, those in and those out. It has nothing to do with color, race, physical location, or any of those things. Either you're inside the camp because you're in covenant, or you're outside the camp, which is everybody else. And what it's saying here is that the nephesh, or the living creature that works, and we're going to get into more detail what that word means, that does work on the Shabbatot, that person was to be cut off, excommunicated, basically thrown outside the camp, or treated at least like they were outside the camp. Treated like they were not part of the group. We were also told that in six, for six days, work was to be done. So we have six days to work. On the seventh day is a Shabbat, excuse me, a Shabbat Shabbaton. Okay, a Sabbath of rest, a day of rest. But it's not just a Shabbat, but it's a Shabbat Shabbaton. Kadosh, holy, set apart to Yahweh. Remember, we talked about it being focused on him. It's got to be a day of resting and refreshing focused on him. The Shabbatot witness and attest to what Yahweh did in creation week that he created. He worked for six days, and then he rested, abstained from work on the seventh day. On the seventh day, we're told that Yahweh was refreshed. The Hebrew word here is Nafash, not nefesh, but nafash, which means to breathe or, breathe or breathe be breathed upon or refreshed is by a current of air. So we think about being filled with his spirit and refreshed by him breathing into us life, re- renewing and, or re-energizing us with life. So could it be that it was on the seventh day Shabbat that Yahweh breathed and refreshed creation 
and that this is exactly what he does every Shabbat. He breathes refreshment on his people who are observing the Shabbat. That was part of what we learned, hopefully, last week. Okay, so now, then we covered the fourth commandment from Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. We were told in Exodus to remember the Shabbat, to set it apart, sanctify it, and make it holy. Remember, had the idea of being mindful of, bringing to the mind, bringing to remembrance. Now, I didn't quote this last week, and I was supposed to, so I'm going to do that now. Okay, but in John 14, and in verse 26, it tells us, he says, but the helper, the set-apart spirit, whom the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all and remind you of all that I have said to you. So this idea of remembering the Sabbath day also connects us to the Ruach there to be that that helps to bring to remembrance. Of course, you can't bring to remembrance that which you didn't put in in the first place. Because remembering is the, is the exercise of going and searching for something you already used to know or did know or should know because it's already in there. And so the Ruach, by the way, is exactly working in that capacity. All of us are expecting the Ruach to do all kinds of things that we've not given it anything to work with. It says that the Ruach is going to remind you of all that I taught you. Well, guess what? If you haven't learned anything, there's nothing to remind you. Okay, so we need to remember the Sabbath day. And so I see an absolute spirit-connected piece to this where the Ruach is a part of this remembering and is there to help inspire you to remember. And then we were taught in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy that we were to guard the Sabbath day, to set it apart, to sanctify it and make it holy. Same idea. But this has the idea of now being careful, being aware of, defending, careful to keep, standing watch over. So not only are we to remember the Sabbath day, to be mindful of it, to not forget it, to be aware of it, but now we're supposed to do it from the idea of protecting it, guarding over it, defending it, standing watch over, and those kind of things. That sounds like an awful lot just for this thing called Shabbat. Now, it says, do all of your labor in, this is back to the fourth commandment, do all of our labor in the, and our work in the six days. So now we have these two words. We're now going to get into more detail what it means to work. Labor and work. It says, do all of your labor and work in six days. Labor is the idea of avod, or avodah, avod, we work. To labor is first mentioned in Genesis 4.12, where we see the tilling of the ground, like this laboring, if you till the ground or labor, it will no longer yield its fruit. This was a punishment on Adam and Chava because of the things that they did wrong. And so this idea of laboring or tilling the ground, doing work to produce fruit, to produce a yield, that is avodah. There's also the connection to slavery and working as a slave and that kind of thing, and we're going to get to that in a second. But the idea of that this is the labor that you do to work or to produce a yield. Then we have melacha, which is actually defined as work, and this is connected to occupation or craftsmanship and their related tasks. Okay, occupation, craftsmanship, and their related tasks. So we're told to not labor or work. Okay, not to do that which is designed to get yield, like your job, but also not to do craftsmanship, which, by the way, could be hobbies and all kinds of things that you just love and enjoy, where you're creatively making things or doing things. This would include art, music, and other things that's not directed directly at him serving him as part of like praise or worship. Because some of us could be just happy as can be to sit there and paint and draw or make music or to do any other creative thing that you do. Make crafts, make... I mean, there's lots of creative things that we do. Writing stories, writing things. Unless it's completely about him, focused on him, to serve him, we have to be very careful of spinning those things. Okay, because that's what that word means, melacha. It's the work that's connected to an occupation or craftsmanship and their related tasks. So let's be careful with that. So he says, do all of those things for six days, but the seventh day is a Shabbat of rest to Yahweh, your Elohim. So everything that we do must be to Yahweh, your Elohim. It's focused on him, directed towards him, and about him. And about him. So let's really be, be careful with that. Because it's very important, because remember what we read 
uh, as part of this is that it said the nefesh or living creature that does melacha was to be cut off. So doing work gets you cut off. Profaning gets you killed. So what's the difference? Profaning means that you are doing complete and treating it with complete irreverent and disrespectful way. So what would be more the difference? Well, if you worked completely in a way that you say, you know what, I know I'm not supposed to, I'm going to do it anyway. Now that's, that's rebellion. That's why the gentleman that was found to be going to gather sticks, they told, they will stone that guy. Why? Because he was doing it to be rebellious in, in, in everybody's face. And we'll read that verse here in a little bit. Well, maybe not even today, we'll see. But the point is, profaning brings death. And maybe not immediate death, but profaning brings death. Work is going to get you cut off. In other words, you are showing and demonstrating that you are not part of the covenant. Which, by the way, that might as well be death. Because it's in the covenant that you find life. Okay? But what's the hope is that if you are in a place of profaning, you might not be redeemable at that point. You're just rebellious. You're just doing what you want to do because you want to do it. As opposed to working, which you may be very reluctant to do and not wanting to do and kind of feel like you're forced to do, but you have to realize that while you're in a place where you still can be redeemed out, for the time period while you're doing it, you're cut off. That cuts you off. And then there may be a process that's necessary to restore you back. So you can't just say, well, I'll work, and that'll cut me off. And then, okay, the next week I won't work, and I'll be back in. It's not that simple. Okay? It's not that simple. Because then, now you're actually in rebellion. You're doing it with conscious desire and knowledge of what you're doing, with full intent to break it, because you really think it's not. It's a, it's a, it's a violence to it. It's a level of irreverence that's, that's beyond just saying, you know, I'm not going to work. This is profaning. Okay, this is profaning. He says that you shall not do any work, you, your children, your servants, your animals, the convert, proselyte within your gates. Those, in other words, that you have responsibility for and authority over are to rest and be refreshed as you do. And this refers back to Genesis 2 where it says that when he completed his work, he rested from all that he had done. Now, but let's understand as we're going back to this avod and melacha, that this, and I said it, and hopefully everybody's receiving it, and I know I got people that aren't going to like this because I already know people that are doing this, and they already told me they don't like it. But you can't just say that, I'll give you an example, all right? I don't generally go out for nature walks. I don't. Like, never, okay? My wife will ask me to and beg me to, and occasionally I will say, okay, I'll do it. But if I were to go on a nature walk, with this specific purpose of enjoying and seeing Yahweh in the nature, that might be a reasonable thing since it's not something that I want to do. I'm only doing it to see him in the nature. I'm going there seeking him. There's no pleasure in it for me. It's not about my pleasure. And we're going to see that when we get to Isaiah 58. However, if you're someone who walks in nature trails three, four times a week, and it is your pleasure, and it's what you love to do, it's going to be a little bit tough to spin and say you're only doing it to focus on the nature and on him. Same thing with bicycle riding or jogging or running or whatever you do that is your pleasure. I'm hoping that's making sense. You are the only one who will know just how big a hypocrite you are. Others might figure it out, because they'll know you enough to know what you're doing and what, and, and what your motivation is. But truly, only you know how big or how small a hypocrite you're being. Okay? There, there cannot be any spinning of this. That's the irreverence. That's the profaning. That's the trying to get what you want out of something that he didn't say you can have. But you could spin it. You can easily do that with almost anything. We, we see people doing this all the time, all throughout the body. You absolutely could do that. Let's be careful with that. Why? Because I want to keep you safe. I don't want you to be considered breaking the covenant and outside the covenant and reneging it, and I certainly don't want you to have death in your future because you profaned it. 
what is motivating you? I mean, do you need to ride that bike or take that walk or do that thing on Saturday? Can't you do that the next day and six other days? Do you have to do it on Shabbat? So when I talk to you and you start arguing with me and defending what you're doing, you know what that's telling me? It's about you. It has to be about you if you're going to argue and fight about it because why is it that important that you do that on Shabbat? There are only a few things that are important you do on Shabbat. And one of them we're going to see in a minute here is that you assemble together. It's a Mikra Kodesh. And so you can't argue with me that it's somehow important and critical that you do your pleasure on his day. Very tough to make that case, at least with me. So at least you've been warned. You want to make that case, go make it with somebody else. It's not going to work with me. I'm not listening. I'm just going to look you in the eye and say, I'm not buying it. Okay? And more importantly, I don't think he's buying it. It doesn't matter if I believe you agree with you. It doesn't matter at all. You're not here to please me. You're here to please him. Okay. So Yahweh then, and we see this in creation, he blessed the Shabbat and set it apart, sanctified, and we talked about that Yahweh did something to the space of time referred to as Shabbat. We're not really clear on what he did to it. He, he says he blessed it, he set it apart, whatever. He did something to that space of time, that period of time. Shabbat observance also was to help us to remember that we were slaves in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, and that Yahweh delivered us out of that slavery. Look, this references back in Exodus 31. It says, do not forget that he did these things because you were slaves in Egypt and he brought you out. Okay, so you were slaves in Egypt and he brought you out. We see that in the Ten Commandments. He says that he chose his people and he wanted those people to rest from all their labors. His chosen people were to rest. We ought to remember that when we were delivered from Mitzrayim, we were not set free to do whatever we wanted to do, but we were set free from Mount one master to serve Yahweh. Romans 6.16 says, you are slave to whom you serve, and he brought you out to serve him, not to serve what you were serving when you were in Egypt, when you were in the wilderness, when you were in the world. Whatever metaphor works for you. And so that's why he references back in the, in the commandments when he says, you remember you were a slave in Egypt and he delivered you out of that. So why are we supposed to remember that? To just think about freedom? No, to be thinking about changing the master to whom you serve. This is the key to Shabbat because Shabbat is about serving the master. Shabbat is about focusing your full attention for one day, just one day. Not even the whole day you're going to sleep some of it. I mean, just for 12 to 28 or whatever. I mean, say you sleep seven or eight hours. That's only 16 hours you need to focus on him. That's all he's asking you. Can you give me 16 to 20 hours or whatever it is you're going to be able to give him? That's, that's all. That's not asking a lot out of a 168-hour week. All right. Let's make sure we're understanding it. So let's talk a little bit more now about guarding the Shabbat. Now, by the way, now everything I just said was all a lead-in to really understanding this. In other words, it's about the mindset. It's about understanding what it means to profane, what it means to work, what it means to put him above you, what it means to focus on him, what it means to be refreshed. All of these things are to set the stage for really understanding all about Shabbat. Because all of your questions really can be handled if you use that framework and say, okay, is this thing I'm asking about Shabbat appropriate to do or not to do based on those answers, that framework? We're going to give you more framework here. So look at Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. We're going to read a couple of verses here. Now I want you to see some things that are connected. Verse 1, Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, Be set apart, for I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am set apart. In other words, you need to be his holy people, set apart for the purpose of serving him. He says, Each one of you should fear his mother and his father and guard my Shabbatot, my Sabbaths. 
He says, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. By the way, all throughout chapter 19 and 20, even in 18, almost every other verse, he says, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. It's almost like, because I said so, because I can, because I'm your father. I have the authority to say this. That's his big giant exclamation point at the end of it, saying, because I said so, and I am Yahweh. Okay? But notice the connection here. He links guarding the Shabbatot to the fifth commandment, which has to do with what? Honoring and respecting authority. He's saying, I want you to fear, that's a, remember the fear of Yahweh teaching? A high level of awe and reverence and respect for your mother and your father. And he says here, and guard my Sabbaths. Why? Because I am the, ultimately the father. Go to chapter, say in this chapter, go to verse 30. So in verse 30, he says, guard my Sabbaths and reverence my set apart place. So now he's linking guarding the Sabbaths. Again, the word there is guard. Verse uh, 3 was guard. Verse 30 is guard the Sabbaths. And he's linking it to now reverencing his set apart place. Hmm. In Leviticus 26, 2, he says the exact same thing, so you don't have to go there again. But he says the exact same thing, guard my Sabbaths and reverence my set-apart place. So Leviticus 26, 2 says the same thing. So a set-apart place is one that has been declared sacred for a specific purpose. In other words, it was set apart as a place for some specifically uh, sacred purpose. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, we're told that we are the dwelling place of the Ruach. So I do not, when he says, guard the Sabbaths, in doing so, you're also reverencing my set-apart place, of which you are one of those places. And so when you don't guard the Shabbat, you're not reverencing one of his set-apart places. He's connected those dots together. Hopefully we can see that. Very important. So the Shabbatot, let's now talk about them being set-apart gatherings, because we do have an argument that comes around about leaving your house on the Sabbath, or, oh, we just have to stay home, and all this other thing. So let's settle that argument, hopefully, once and for all. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23, and in verse 1. Leviticus 23, in verse 1, And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the appointed times of Yahweh, which you are to proclaim as set apart gatherings, my appointed times are these. Six days is work done. Excuse me, six days work is done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a set apart gathering. You do no work. It is a Sabbath to Yahweh in all your dwellings. Okay, now, let's understand what this is talking about. First of all, it says here, that these, Moedim, right, the appointed times, the Hebrew there is Moedei, appointments. In other words, fixed times or seasons, specifically festivals, assemblies, as convened for a definite, specific purpose. We talked about that being part of the, referencing the set-apart place, which is a place that has a specific purpose. Well, these are times, spaces of time that have very specific purposes, and so the Hebrew word moad comes from the word ya'ad, which means to fix upon, by agreement or appointment. By implication here, it means to meet at a stated time, to be summoned or to summon, as in like an engagement, I can, I, even as in the idea of marriage, like engagement for marriage. There's even hints of marriage in the Sabbath thing and in the feast days, that these are appointed times of engagement with the bride and the groom. And then the word for set-apart gatherings is mikra'e, which means something called out. In other words, a public meeting, also a rehearsal. Again, hints at things like a wedding. But it's a public meeting, something that's called out, not something you do alone in your house. Not something you even do with other people necessarily in your house. It has to do with a public meeting. It has to do with a public meeting. Now, we have in the appointed times of Yahweh teaching a listing of the seven annual Shabbatot, in other words, there are seven of them here in chapter 23. Actually, there are eight because the Sabbath is the first one. But there are seven additional ones to the weekly Shabbat. And they are the first day of unleavened bread, Shavuot, trumpets, atonement, the first day of Sukkot, and the eighth day festival called Shemini Atzeret. So you have seven additional ones. Now, in making this case about staying in one place or not, 
or doing this as it going outside, I want us to break some things down here from um, Exodus. Let's see. How should we treat... Okay, the next section I have is how should Shabbat be remembered and guarded? And I believe that, it says, I believe that Shabbat observance questions can be easily answered for the most part by looking at the questions in the context of holy or set-apart time. Okay, because remember Genesis 2, we talked about it being set-apart time. Now let's go to Exodus 16 and look at this, this whole wording of the Shabbat instructions that they're getting when they're first coming out of Egypt. Exodus 16, we're going to begin in verse 23. Exodus 16 and in verse 23. And he said to them, this is what Yahweh has said. Tomorrow is a rest, a Sabbath set apart to Yahweh. That which you bake, bake, and that which you cook, cook, and lay up for yourselves all that is left over to keep it until morning. And they laid it up until morning, and as Moses commanded, and it did not stink and no worm was found there. So we're dealing with the manna. Okay, we're dealing with the manna. We're also dealing with quails here, but we're dealing with the manna. It says right before this, we're dealing with the, the, the manna that each one was gathering. And so here he says that you're going to make and prepare it and do what you need to, and then it didn't stink the next day. And Moses said, eat it today, verse 25, for today is a Sabbath to Yahweh. Today you do not find it in the field. Gather it six days, but on the seventh day, which is Sabbath, there is none so first he's telling them, you're going to do this tomorrow, and they did. And they came back, and it didn't stink. He said they laid it up, and they did it, and it didn't stink. And now he says, now this is the pattern you're going to behave with. You're going to have six days of work, and then you're going to have this thing called the Sabbath. So for six days, you're going to gather, and then on the Sabbath, there's not going to be any. So you're going to, he says, no, look, gather for six days, but on the Sabbath, which, uh, excuse me, the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there's none. And it came to be that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, found none. Yahweh says to Moses, listen to this now. Talk about back to profaning and disregarding and not listening and disobeying. He says, Yahweh said to Moses, how long shall you refuse to guard my commands and my Torah? My Torah tie would really be, that would be the Torah tie or my Torah, my Torah. He says, see, because Yahweh has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he's giving you bread for two days on the sixth day. He's giving you what you need. Why is that not enough? That's a good question for all of us in general, I think. He gives us what, I, what we need. Why is that never enough? He says, let each one stay in his place. Do not let anyone go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now, let's stop there for a second. All right, as we just finished there. Let's start breaking this thing down, and we're going to get to that remaining in one place thing. Let's watch how this plays through. So first he says, tomorrow is a rest, a set-apart day to Yahweh. So again, he's reminding us right there, the same as we find in other places, that it's a day focused and dedicated to Yahweh. Then he says, bake whatever you wish to bake and cook what you wish to cook and put aside the leftover for you to eat on Shabbat. So your cooking and preparation of the food needed to be done before Shabbat. And then he says, six days you're given to do this kind of work. And then he says, look, let every man remain in his place, a reference to not going out to gather the manna. They were told to stay in, his, each one to stay in his place till after they went out. Um, oh, let me see. They were okay, they were not told got to read my notes right. This is what I get for having notes. I never have notes. This is great. So I'm actually trying to read notes. Okay. They were not told, notice this, they were not told to stay each one in his place till after they had already gone out and broken it the first time. Follow what's happening here. It says in verse 23, do not go out, etc. And it says, and they laid it up to morning and it did not stink. So they did exactly what they were told the first time. They did. Then it came next that some of them went out to gather on the Sabbath. So now they've already disobeyed. And then he says, let each one stay in his place. That's our big quotes there, stay in his place. Now when you look at the Hebrew, and we're going to look at some verses here, this may not be referring to staying physically in a place, but rather staying in your position as it relates to authority. Oh boy, 
<laughs> Rabbi, where are you going now? Maybe this isn't talking about just physically staying in a spot because they left their position of authority and disobeyed and took it upon themselves self-sovereignly to go out and do what they wanted to do. How do I know that this is a reasonable conclusion? Because that sounds very strange probably to all of you. Rabbi, where are you getting that? I don't know. Let's go to Genesis 36. Reshit, Genesis 36. I'm read verse 33. This is the same Hebrew word where it says, let each one stay in his place. Now notice that actually in the verse it said two things. It said, let each one stay in his place, and it said, do not let anyone go out of his place. And guess what? Two different words. Well, let's understand. Okay? The way the word is kind of used in the Hebrew there. So here, the first one here is talking about the same word here is in Genesis 36. And I mean, excuse me, 36 and verse... Um, 33. And Bella died, and Yovavad, excuse me, uh, Yovav, son of Zerach, a Betzra, reigned in his place. Is that talking about a physical location? Or is it talking in the position of authority? Oh, wait a minute. Let's look at verse 34. And Yovav died, and Husham, uh, Husham of the land of the Temanites reigned in his place. And Husham died, and Hadad, uh, the son of Bedad, who smote the Midian, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his place. Verse 36, and Hadad died, and Samla of Masrecha reigned in his place. In verse 37, we see another person reigning in his place. In verse 38, reigning in his place. Are we getting the hint here? So there, there's a reason to believe that this word is not necessarily just talking about a physical location. By the way, go to Exodus 29, in verse 29. Exodus 29, and in verse 29. And the set-apart garments of Aharon are for his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be ordained in them. Okay, so here we're reading in verse 29. Look at what happens when we get to verse 30. The priest from his sons in his place puts them on, the sev uh, on for seven days. In other words, the priest who had the position of authority was to put them on his sons. Again, we're talking about a position of authority. Look at Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 22. Oh, when this hit me last night, as I was reviewing, this is always the way it works. I have the teaching put together, then I do a review, and it lasts until about 3 in the morning. So you wonder sometimes why I get here at 12.30. But when he showed me this, I was thinking, oh, is this not a little different than all the people making an argument that they can't leave their house, they're supposed to just be at home? Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 22. 6.22. And the anointed priest from among his sons who was in his position, in his place of authority, he prepares it, a law forever to Yahweh. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 6. Are we seeing something, a pattern here? Deuteronomy 10 and in verse 6. Now the children of Israel sent, set out from the wells of Benai Yakan to Mosrah. Aharon died there and he was buried there and Eleazar, his son, became priest in his place. He took his position of authority. I could go on and on. There's a million of them. And so now let's go back and look at Exodus 16. Okay, Exodus 16. Hopefully this is just like light bulbs should be shooting off in your head, okay? Exodus 16, and it says here, now remember the process. They were fine. In verse 25, Moses says, eat it today for today's the Sabbath. Today you do not go in the field, gather for six days, and then on, the, on the seventh day there'll be none. And it came to be that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, and they found none. And then Moses was told by Yahweh, how long are you guys going to just like, you know, be re rebellious? You're not going to listen. You're going to refuse to guard my commands. And then he says in verse 29, let each one stay in his place, in his position of authority. Stop being self-sovereign and thinking you can decide what you need to do on my time and my day that I told you what to do and what not to do. And then he says, do not let anyone go out of his place. 
on the seventh day. So now, because they acted like three-year-olds, he says, now you need to go to your room and stay there. So this does literally mean stay physically in your spot. So because they rebelled, because they were self-sovereign, because they were not listening, he said, you need to stay in your position of authority, not usurp authority, not go out beyond the bounds of your authority, and on top of that, go to your room and stay there. Now, this is Exodus 16. We're going to get to eventually Leviticus 23, where they're being instructed as a corporate nation now as they're getting prepared to go into the land and saying, look, when you go there now that you're no longer hopefully three-year-olds and you can be trusted to try to make an attempt at least to guard my instructions, my Torah, guard the Torah, you need to understand that this is a day that has a mikra kodesh a commanded assembly. And so as long as you can stay in your place of authority, you can leave your physical place and go to the place that I've told you to go to gather together. So remember, the people didn't follow the instructions correctly initially, but what we see is if, back in Exodus 16, at the last verse there it says, so the people rested on the seventh day. In verse 30, he, they actually finally got it at some point. They did rest. But it took him scolding them and treating them like little children, saying, you don't seem to understand your place, so now go, go to your room and stay there on Shabbat. But he wants to meet with us as a group. And so that punishment, just like when you send your child to time out, is your child still there? Did you let him out eventually? That's what we're seeing here. And so, but see, you have to get the context of the flow. They were told what to do the very first time. They did it fine because they didn't know what was going on. And then, very quickly, they were not guarding. They were just going to say, well, I'll just do whatever, you know, I mean, what ba how bad could it be? I'll go out there, I'll get more stuff, you know, whatever. Probably those that didn't prepare the double, they just ate the double. Hey, I'm just going to stuff my face. There'll be more tomorrow. They weren't trusting him. And they weren't listening. So the biggest part of this is they weren't staying in their place authoritatively. Is that making sense now? When you break Shabbat, you are not staying in your place. Whatever you do. Even if you're doing it in your house, you can break Shabbat in your house. And if you're breaking Shabbat, it's because you've no longer stayed in your place of limited authority. In other words, you didn't stay under authority like you should. He's saying, how long are these people going to refuse to listen to me? When are they going to recognize that I am their authority? The self-sovereign stuff has got to stop, he's saying. Okay, so hopefully that helps clarify some of this. So we are not to do this in our house necessarily. We are to do this with people together as best we can. That doesn't make, by the way, i got to clarify this because people will not understand. You are not in sin and wrong and rebellious and profaning it if you're doing this in your house. Some of you don't have any place to go. He understands that. Okay? There's refusing and choosing not to, and there's also that which you had no choice. In other words, that which is outside of your control. If you have no place to go, if you have nothing that you can do, if you have no options, then he understands that. That's one of the reasons why we have provided you with this live stream. Or for those of you that are listening or watching, we provide a live stream of our service to try to at least connect up people as best we can who, can, who don't have a place viably to connect to. Who do not have a place viably to connect to. This, this is, is critical. So you are to make the effort to connect with others where he's placed his name, where he's doing what he's doing, even if it's in your living room on a screen until the day he provides you with a physical place you can go. And by the way, if you're home fellowshipping, that is a stepping stone. That is a way to gather some people together of like mind and eventually bring it outside. Now, if your home fellowship is publicly accessible and publicly available, then that would be one thing. But if it's not, then you're really still not doing this public assembly. So the home fellowship has got to be the initial place, not the ending place. You see them doing this in, you know, people say, well, look in the New Testament, the early church in the first century, blah, 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 all met in houses. Yes, they did, but not all of them. 
and not forever. A lot of them met at the synagogues. A lot of the synagogues were messianic synagogues once they heard about Messiah, embraced Messiah. And so a lot of the synagogues, which is where people went, still were teaching people Torah in the context now of Mashiach, of Messiah. But the home fellowships were places where there wasn't enough people gathered together to take them out somewhere else, and so they would gather together. Also, they needed to be in some place where it was safe. Remember, the first century people were under persecution. You're not. It wasn't safe for them to just go necessarily out there and find a place in the public to do these things. First century people were under Roman authority. They weren't just free. They weren't living in the land under Israel authority. They were under Roman authority. So there are a lot of other pieces of the context to explain why they were doing what they were doing. So let's hopefully we're embracing these things because this is really important that we're starting to break these things down. Okay, so now I've got to cover a couple of more things here to then go back to this bake, bake, cook, cook thing. So then we're told in Exodus 34, I want to just, just kind of cover some things here. We'll go to Exodus 34 and verse 21. We're trying to understand how we keep Shabbat at this point. Okay, how do we do this? Exodus 34 and verse 21 says, Six days you work, but the seventh day you rest. In plowing time and in harvest time you rest. What? What does that mean? What does the harvest and plowing have to do with Shabbat? What he's saying here is simple. The most critical time where you might in that day, in the agricultural day, think to justify and spin that it's okay to break Shabbat was during harvest or plowing. You needed to get that crop in, and you needed to get that crop out, or bad things happened to that crop. And he's saying, hey, in plowing time and in harvest time, it's all hands on deck, everybody's working, not on Shabbat. Even in plowing and harvesting, you take the rest. So that's a critical verse, because a lot of people will say, oh, but you know, my boss or this or that, or I have to provide for my family and all this other stuff, I can't, I can't not work on Shabbat. In harvest time and in plowing, or plowing and harvest, put it in the right order, you are to rest. Well, you don't understand. I'm going to lose my job. Well, you think the only person that's ever told me that? You don't think I've ever experienced that threat? Like this is something new? I'm sorry to say and shock the life out of you, but there are an incredible number of jobs that never work weekends, that never work Saturdays. I know that may shock a lot of you, but some of you have not striven to make the effort to get the higher level skills that are necessary for the jobs that work Monday through Friday. If you're going to stay, and I'm not insulting you, please don't be offended, I'm not picking on you, but if you're going to choose to work in retail, fast food, factories, warehouses, and all of the lower level blue collar jobs, you're going to be subject to all of that mess. But there's nothing that says you have to stay in that kind of job. Your choice. There's nothing to stop you from finding something that you are capable of and talented enough to do that doesn't require Saturday. Because I've had people say to me, but you don't understand, Rabbi, there aren't any jobs around here that don't work Saturday. Not in your industry, but I can come to wherever you live and find you a good giant number of jobs in your help wanted section that don't work Saturdays. Oh, but I don't, have, I don't have those talents and skills, so go get them. What's stopping you? You can get education or training or disciple, you know, what mentoring like for a skill. You can learn how to do something that doesn't require it. Oh, but you don't understand, you know, please pray because, you know, you know, there's no work here that doesn't require Saturday. I don't know any town anywhere where everybody's job, only the jobs, everybody works Saturday. Matter of fact, I know a lot of places that if I wanted to get an appointment or do something, they're closed on the weekend, the whole weekend. They're Monday to Friday jobs. Now, there's a ton of them. But the problem is, are you willing to go and make the effort to get the skill set, education, or abilities to get those kind of jobs? 
I'm sorry, but it's going to take you outside of your comfort zone. But, but you know what? How important is it to, to please your Heavenly Father and guard the Shabbat? You know, maybe this is to light a fire under you to be, you know what? I bet you, I could almost guarantee that almost every one of those people that is going to tell me about their horrible situation with their Shabbat job is struggling to take care of their family already anyway. In other words, those jobs don't really take care of families. Those jobs do not provide the abundance that you need to have a comfortable. Comfortable meaning lack of stress. I don't mean comfortable meaning you have all these extra luxuries. I mean comfortable so you're not constantly fearful that you'll have more month at the end of the money. Anybody have that problem? But wait a minute, there's still more month. I ran out of money. Wouldn't you be much more comfortable if you had more money at the end of the month? There are jobs that do that. And by the way, almost all of you that will tell me you're afraid to lose your job will also tell me how much you hate your job and wish you had a different job. And all of a sudden you love your job when your job gets threatened to be taken away from you. Really? Only you know how big a hypocrite. Remember we said that earlier? We're going to turn that into, I'm sure, an in-focus. How big a hypocrite are you? I mean, only you know. Some of you will come to me and tell me for months how much you hate your job and it's so awful and it's abusive and it's emotionally abusive, it's physically, whatever it is, and then all of a sudden the boss says, we're changing the schedule, you now need to work two Shabbats a month, and now you're afraid you're going to lose your job that you hate. Haven't you been praying for a better job? Haven't you been praying for Abba? Well, maybe this is his answer. Why is that so bad? Maybe he needs to move you to someplace else in the country, which, by the way, might protect you from a disaster or something else. Maybe he's doing, who knows what he's doing? How about being ready and available to say, what are you doing, not what do I want to do and what I'm comfortable with? Because our biggest hero, okay, maybe not biggest, I don't know your personal preference, but one of our biggest heroes is Avram. And what did Avram do? He said to Avram, get up and go to a place I'm going to show you. Leave your house, leave your family. He's a big hero. Are we heroes or cowards? Ooh. Rabbi, that's not nice. I don't want you to be in trouble. I don't want you to be outside the camp. I don't want him to look at you as a goy, as a goyim. I want him to look at you as covenanted. I want him to look at you as part of the body. And it's going to take courage. Guarding takes courage. Do you want a coward guarding you? Okay? I need a bodyguard. I'm like a big famous person. I'm going to be traveling to places where I could be at risk. So let me go find a coward who at the first sign of boo is going to run. Is that guarding? No, guarding is the guy who's going to stand in the breach and say, I don't care what you do to me. I'm not moving. I'm guarding something. That's what we're looking for. Someone who's going to say, I am guarding this and there's no moving me. It's going to take courage. Do we have that kind of courage? So it says here, in plowing time and in harvest time. So you can't say, but you don't understand, that work comes in in, in sort of waves at my job or if I don't get this work, you know, after a certain period of time, there's no work for six months. I have to take the work when it's here. No, you don't. You can get a job that actually works all year long. Why would you work at a job that constantly, emotionally jerks you all over the place? Let somebody else have that kind of a job. Go do something else. But I love my job. Really? Do you love it enough to be jerked around like this all the time? There are ways to assess what you love and what you're good at and start writing those details down and figure out what jobs utilize those skills. And you may be shocked to find there was plenty of them. I did this exercise with three people last week because they're struggling with things. And I said, have you thought about doing something else? And they're like, no. I'm like, why not? Well, I only know how to do this. That's not true because whatever it is that this is that you're doing requires a whole series of skills and talents. And you can find, I had one person because their job had them working outside, well, I like to work outside. Lots of jobs have you working outside. Well, I like to work with customers who I get to work with on a regular basis, develop relationships. Lots of jobs have that. Well, I like to do... There's lots of jobs that do those things. I promise you, you're the one limiting him. 
You are limiting his ability to provide you with whatever it is that, that, he's, that you want, that you've asked for, and he wants to give it to you. Challenging, very challenging. All right, let's continue. Exodus 35 in verse 1. We've got a few more minutes here, so let's quickly get into some things here. Exodus 35 in verse 1. And Moses assembled all the congregation of the children of Israel and said to them, These are the words which Yahweh has commanded you to do. Work is done for six days, but on the seventh day it is... It's, it's funny, like, has Moses said this already? How many times do we have to hear the same thing? Seventh, seventh day it shall be set apart to you a Sabbath of rest to Yahweh. Anyone doing work on it shall be put to death. Do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Okay, so now let's deal with this tremendous stressor within the body. The kindling of fire. <laughs> Don't kindle a fire in any of your dwellings. Okay, so first of all, we have the Hebrew word uh, tavaru. Okay, tavaru means literally to kindle or to light, to burn, or to set something burning. Then we also have the Hebrew word tavair. Okay, now the tavaru is the root word for the word that's actually in this verse. Okay, tavair means to remove Actually, I may have it backwards. Tavaru might be the word here, but tavair means to remove. Isn't that interesting? So we have fire and the idea of removing. So this is not to be done in any of your dwelling places. So what, let's have, like, what's really going on here? He's saying, first of all, do not remove a fire from your dwelling to go bring it to go do other things with it that you shouldn't be doing with it. Hmm, that's different. The word has a strong sense of, if you look up that word and go find it all over the scriptures, a lot of it has to do with removing, not just burning or kindling. So don't remove that fire from your dwelling, because you might need a fire in your dwelling to keep you warm. But also it says, this was not to be done in any of your dwellings. It says here, listen, it says, do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So you were not supposed to do this in any of your dwellings. It didn't say that you couldn't have fire, but you're not to kindle it or remove it in your dwellings. So he doesn't want you in your, in your dwelling to be starting fires. Starting meaning you have to go there and get the kindling and everything else and to kindle the fire. That's why they call it kindling. <laughs> it's that which is used to kindle the fire, not the kindle you read your books on. Okay? Which is why they have a version called the kindle fire. You get that? All right, but they call it kindling, the stuff that's used to start the fire. So in the Jewish community, they will transfer flame by taking from one flame that's already been kindled and transferring it to another place that they need fire. That's okay to do, but the thing is that we're understanding is that it has to do with removing. They, he didn't want them taking the fire outside, and that's where they did their cooking, they didn't cook inside, they cooked outside. That's where they did the fires for work, for smelting, for, for the things that had to be made with fire. He says, so on the Sabbath day, your fires to be kept, just keep yourself warm in your tent, that's fine. Because let's not kid ourselves, they were in the desert. It got cold at night. It got colder in the day sometimes too. And don't say, well, they had the pillar of the fire Listen, if that fire from the pillar of fire was warm enough to keep a, a, I don't know how many square miles camp warm, people real close to it were dead. Okay? Ever get near a fire? It doesn't feel very much, and then all of a sudden it feels ridiculously hot as you, get to, you cross a threshold, and now you're that close to it. So imagine as you walk away, how quickly do you feel nothing from that fire? Pretty quickly. So for that fire to be warm enough to go miles... Everybody close to it would have been cinders. <laughs> so they had fire. But again, let's understand the Hebrew here. It says, do not kindle. That word there means to burn or to remove. Hmm. So you put that together. I'm guessing that there was some sort of hint here idiomatically that they weren't to take or remove the fire from their dwelling. That's different, isn't it? Don't remove the fire from your dwelling. And don't make one from scratch. You should have prepared it like prepared. You know what? If you are to cook and bake on Friday, 
on the preparation day in advance of Shabbat. You're also to get your fire set and ready before Shabbat. It's just about preparation. Anybody ever make a fire from scratch? If not, have anybody seen somebody make a fire from scratch? Does it take a little bit of work? And I'm not talking about that you put this, you know, the, the lighter fluid and other things that you use to cheat, so to speak. They didn't have any of this stuff. Okay, they had the flint and the rock and they had to spark the fire. Or what they more likely did was they had a consistent transferring of fire from one fire to another fire. They took the flame and brought it over to the kindling and lit that with the flame from another fire. One of the most important jobs in a camp was someone's job was to not let the fire go out. Keep it going. Once they got one going, that was a big job, keeping the fire going. Okay, so you could transfer it. So hopefully this is going to help in our understanding of this idea of not kindling a fire in any of your dwellings. So let's now match that up with this idea of baking and cooking. And so this all goes together. On Shabbat... We are not to be doing any of the major preparations that should have been done on Friday. We are to eat what we already prepared. So nothing should need to be cooked. Nothing should be need to be baked on the Shabbat. Okay, when he says boil what you shall boil, it's not so much about the water being hot. It's about the idea of making things like soup, stews, things that they would cook in the boiling. Things that would need to be cooked. I've had people say, well, it's no big deal. I've got a grill. I can throw a few burgers on it. It's no effort at all, blah, blah, blah. The meat needs to be cooked. You're cooking. I'm going to be conservative and err on the side of what he said. I'm not going to cook. Now, I feel relatively comfortable about eating something that's already been cooked and warming it up. That's not cooking. Cooking has a definition, okay? That's not cooking, that's warming it up. And we have modern conveniences that allow you to warm something up. Right, so I have no problem if you have things in a crock pot that just need to be plugged in and warmed up that you already cooked. So let's say you have children and you made the mac and cheese on Friday in a crock pot and you're just going to warm it up on Shabbat. You can disagree, I'm going to get all kinds of, who knows what I'm going to get on YouTube for all of this, who cares? It is what it is. <laughs> Okay? Everybody's entitled to their opinion. I don't mean to be callous and say, who cares? I have, I'm responsible for what I have to do. I'm responsible for people listening to me. I'm I take very seriously all of this. And I don't feel comfortable telling you that it's okay for you to cook anything or bake anything. But I don't have a problem with you warming something up that's already cooked. But it also has to require no preparation because it was about preparation. It should not need you to prepare anything. It should just need to be warm. By the way, you can avoid all of this, which I highly recommend, by eating everything that's already okay to eat cold. But th is there really much difference between keeping something in the refrigerator or warming it up? Not really. Both are being done to maintain the appropriate temperature to consume the food. So I don't see a whole lot of difference between that. If you're going to use a refrigerator, it shouldn't be a problem for you to warm something up. That's still not cooking. Whatever you're eating should be already edible whether you warm it up or not. In other words, it's cooked and edible. And by the way, a lot of things that you cook taste very good cold. And you don't really need to cook them or warm them up. Well, let's just understand where this all plays through. How do we keep the Shabbat? As a conservatively and seriously as we can. That's how we keep the Shabbat. All right. I think that's going to cover it for where I'm at. It's already uh, an hour and five minutes or so. And I do have quite a bit more, so I guess we're going to go to part, part three. Although I don't think we're going to get a whole lot further. I think three is going to do it, so that's good. I'm happy with that, and I'm comfortable with that. So hopefully this is helpful in getting there to where you need to be with understanding Shabbat. It's about what we need to do to protect the time. Now, I should have said this is part of the cooking thing. Why is it that we don't cook or kindle fire on Shabbat, if we are actually burning or sending, making one from scratch, because those things take time. Now, I know they don't take as much time nowadays as they used to, but it was about protecting the time. And by the way, I've cooked a few things in my life that took a lot of time, all right? I'm known for a lasagna that I make 
Well, you know what? The way I make it takes me a half an hour to just to get it to, into the oven. That's a lot of time. Well, if we're going to protect those 16 hours or so of time, we're not going to be doing a very good job of it if we're preparing food and cooking and everything else, baking and those kind of things. All of you know how much time you spend Friday doing all of that to get ready for Saturday. It's not taking five minutes. I don't care what you want to convince me. Okay? It's taking a lot of time. This is all about the context of two things, time and focusing everything in that time on him. That should answer every Shabbat question. Am I protecting the time so that I could focus on him? That, that actually, every question you can think of, just about, is answered with that, what I just said right there. Is what I'm doing protecting that time so I can focus on him? We'll leave it at that. Let's go before the Father. Shabbat, Shabbat shalom to you, Father, on this Shabbat. Father, we are so thankful for the Shabbat. We are so blessed by Shabbat. And as a matter of fact, I don't know that we would study the way we study if it wasn't for Shabbat to give us that time to study like we do. We certainly wouldn't come together without it being a Mikra Kodesh and spending the time together. And so, Father, in your, in your incredible, loving, generous wisdom, you've given us this time. Because it's not just about time focused on you, but in focusing on you, we are blessed in every area of our life. We're blessed in our interactions with not only you, but with each other, because we come together to focus, to, focus on you as a group and to come together in one mind of one purpose and one focus. So, Father, help us to truly understand Shabbat, to truly understand what you mean when you say to remember it and to guard it, what it means to stay in one's place, the place of authority, not usurp, what it means to bake and cook, etc. How do we keep Shabbat? Because just about everybody who's listening to this message is already convinced that they're supposed to do something with this thing called Shabbat. But they struggle with what, how, even when. What do we do with Shabbat? Father, we look to you to answer these questions of confusion, to settle the arguments, to bring us to clarity. And so, Father, we lay ourselves at your mercy, at your feet, and we implore you, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to truly receive what exactly it is you are saying here regarding Shabbat, here in your word. So, Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you glory and honor, appreciating so much this Sabbath day, which we are celebrating right now, just really appreciating it even more and more as we come to you in authority, the authority as we try to stay in our place, we follow in the authority of the one you put in the place called Mashiach, the place called the Son, the place called the firstborn of my Methi brothers, the place of Mashiach, our, our older brother, Yeshua. And it's in his name and it's in his authority that we come. And we thank you and praise you. Amen. Amen.